welcome to Quok Talk Revisited. I did have a few year hiatus and I'm here back. And this time my subtitle is Breaking Boundaries. This time I'm back and trying to push the way we look at everything. So, you know, whether it's race, gender, politics of framing, this is where it's going to be from a feminist and performative lens. And I'd love to kick off today's topic with something by centering around a specific historical character. Um, and this woman is quite controversial. People don't know much about her or worse, they have this glamorized view of her because of the nature of her business. She was a prostitute during the World War II, actually before that in the late 30s in Honolulu. And I'm here with a historian who's going to shed more light and to dismantle these old ways of thinking of what we thought we knew about it. And so without further ado, let me just introduce my wonderful first guest of my pop pop <laughs> return, Wendy Tolleson. Wendy is a Kama'aina raised on Ford Island. She researches and writes about topics relating to the 20th century Honolulu, Hawaii Islands, and Maui for historic preservation projects for the historic Honoka'a Town Project, the Palama Settlement, and the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transit and others. She's produced studies of land ownership and written about dance halls, vaudeville, pool halls, hoi making, vice, prostitution in the Ivile and Chinatown, architecture, redevelopment in Aala and the military, and many ethnicity themes. So quite appropriate in talking about today's topic, uh, the question is who was Jean O'Hara? A book she <laughs> self-produced has created a myth, a legend about the, you know, the, the extravagance and the sexual life of a prostitute here. So Wendy, welcome to Think Tech and to Quok Talk to talk about this racy topic. Well, thank you. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so, all right, so you have lived here, you, you know, it's really quite interesting to hear what you have to say about this, because you come from a perspective of, I know your background was in archaeology, so you're used to digging. And by digging, it's really looking into what has been produced, what has been created, what, what's out there in the archives, what's missing. And a lot of times is challenging what's out there and how things are misread or misinformed, right? So yeah. I want it, I think that this Jean O'Hara is a perfect candidate for this topic because it's like, we don't really know who she was. We're fascinated by her life. And yet there's so much that we think we know, but do not. So perhaps you can give us a little background of who she is in a nutshell, and then we'll go back to give context to why she was in Hawaii. Okay. Um, first of all, let me clarify something, and that is that Jean O'Hara has been used as a factual source in, I couldn't even tell you how many papers, PhD theses, um, popular culture, uh, a number of other things, and um, quite frankly, a lot of what she has written about didn't happen in World War II, which is where she's used in context quite a bit, almost exclusively. Um, she wasn't even here until 1938. Right. So a lot of what she writes about, she could have gotten out of a newspaper um and or from they're they're just so stories in a lot of ways i've been able to document a lot of the things that she talks about but it's usually things that happen to her and one of the problems i had with this uh document that she wrote was that she's not she doesn't really talk about prostitution in a context that makes much sense except about herself why do you think people have not challenged it in the past? Do you think people just love her story so much that they don't want to think that it's not true? Well, it's salacious and it's popular. Yeah. Um, it takes quite a bit of documentation to understand what was going on here in World War II. And um, she, you know, these, these, it, this information, most of it wasn't produced until she was long gone, but it can be found. And, uh, um, so, you know, she writes about what was going on in the 1930s. So these phrases that, you know, three minutes for three dollars and all and, um, you know, uh, black folk and plantation workers had to come in from a different door. Yeah. I have never found any documentation about that. 
Really? Um, no. And I traced her quite a bit. She comes from, she, she comes from, she's born in Blue Springs, Mississippi. Okay, so she's a Southern Belle, a white lady who comes to Hawaii. Right, and from, she Indiana. Comes from, from right, Indiana. Okay. And okay. she does come through San Francisco, like most of the prostitutes did, but others came from Los Angeles. Okay. Um, and um, she comes in in 1938. She goes by several names while she's here. Uh, Betty Jean O'Hara, which is what she's most well known for. But she also was Betty Jean Quinn, because when she came here, she brought her husband, who was four years younger than she, at 18 <laughs> years old, and married him here. Um, she also goes by Jeanette Blake, Jean Johnson, Jean O'Hare, and finally Jean Norger, who is what a lot of people, you know, the other name they attached to her. Uh, but she, like I said, she doesn't really provide much context, um, and she devotes a lot of what she's writing about to herself. Not really. So about herself, though, in her background, before she came here, as I understand, she grew up in a quite a religious family, quite conservative, and yes, her, her father was a were... doctor. Father was a, a doctor. doctor. Okay. And um, she writes, you know, she writes only a few pages about who she is and um, but mainly it's it's how she feels about what she's doing and how she started. Okay. Um, she doesn't say, really say where she started, except she, she, she does say she comes from San Francisco, but that was a leaping off point for a lot of people. And then she sure. gets into descriptions about uh, venereal disease and a number of other things. Um, yeah, her, her okay, name. let's back up a little bit. The book that okay. she we based a lot of the sources from. What can you just give us? Maybe we can. This is a good time to show the cover of the book too. Um, and this is the only publishing that everybody's kind of basing their stories off of, right? Right. So she self published that book. Is that right? Or who published? No, it's book? published by a company that no longer I can find no evidence of, and the uh, the, the front art. I cannot find that person. And the person who wrote the foreword, I cannot find that person either. Okay, um, but is there something to say about a woman who takes advantage of her popularity, if you will, um, her agency, her voice, to be able to produce something that's going to show um, a portrait of the war that we rarely see? Is there validation from that? Perspective. There, there's only some because, as I said, she doesn't really provide a context for actually everything that's going on. Um, she, actually, prostitutes in World War II were had had a lot of agency. They had a lot of power. Uh, they were, you know, in the 1930s, which is what she's writing about. Yes, there is a lot of control by the police department beginning in 1932, but prior to that, and there were, a lot of them were here in the late 20s. Um, prostitution was not a big thing that the police dealt with. They were interested in bootlegging because it was during the, the during prohibition. So when they finally got around to uh oh, hello, <laughs> I told you <laughs> that it went out. When they got around to actually starting to um, deal with prostitution in the late thirties. There was a lot printed in the newspaper about it because prostitution was not a crime here until 1942. So they were being arrested and charged for vagrancy. Okay, but okay, so you say that it was illegalized in 1942, but during the war, wasn't that the time when the martial law and the military kicked in to regulate it? So in that sense, Absolutely. it was legalized, wasn't it? Or just yes, and this is the difference between what she's writing about and the reality, because everything she's writing about with the exception of a few things, for instance, her um, her assault by Captain Kennedy and her arrest for speeding and uh, and also finally her attempted murder charge. Those all happened. One happened in 1941 and the others happened in 1940, late 44, just before prostitution was ended. And then she went on to be here until about 1947. But okay, most so of when she came in 1938, sorry, um, yeah. prostitution was already quite, you know, a, a booming business, if you will. People it had been booming from... business since Evie Lay. So Evie 1920s, Lay was... you're talking yeah. about then? Yes. Okay. Yes, and because... but these were, but Evie Lay were Japanese women. Um, but you're talking, I'm talking about the, full, the white women who came in. Yes, I mean Evie Lay was not all Japanese. Most of it was, but when the it was finally shut down for good in 1919. So there was a kind of a vacuum, um, okay. you know, some of the 
uh, you know, you don't see very many Japanese or Chinese prostitutes at that point, and a lot of women. I want to show, I saw, hair. I know you sent me this, and maybe you can tell the source of it, but um, you said it was a postcard, right? It's a postcard. These are postcards that were taken in amusement halls that were very common here in World War II. Uh, and a sailor could come in and pay a certain amount of money and pose with a, with a young woman who was being hired for so many cents a postcard to produce this postcard. And they wanted something exotic. So they were always, almost always uh, Chinese Hawaiian, Hawaiians or something like that. They right. never posted white women. So, but it's interesting. So, okay, well, I have this other one. This is, it looks like it's a white, one white woman and one uh, mm -hmm. Japanese, uh, Asian woman, right? Yes, I can't so, explain that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to think of like how the ethnicity played into this whole, uh, sex industry at the time, because if a lot of the women coming in from California, as you said, were mostly white, but then prostitution existed in Hawaii at the time with mostly local women. Not really not post Evie Lay. I have found very little evidence of uh, other ethnicities rather than white women. And if you look at the 1940 census for that area, all of them are white. Now it's interesting because the madams are Korean, but the women are white and they come from all over the country. A lot of them came from the South. And unfortunately they didn't do ethnicity. So it's hard to tell whether these- But surely women... there were prostitutes from, from Hawaii, you know, um, with all the Asians and API and different types of um, ethnicities here already before- I have not been able to document that. Okay. Because that sort of thing is not included in official records. Okay. So based just, on official records, you're saying that mostly um, were white women who came out to take advantage of this booming industry. Now, there are some hints in the documents that there are black women because when the military came in and threw out Gabrielson's rules, which is what Jean O'Hara is talking about, is how they were. Can you remind us who Gabrielson is for people who don't know who he oh, is? I'm sorry, Chief Gabrielson. He became the the police of chief chief of police here in 1932, and okay. he was from the mainland. And he came in and put through a bunch of rules for prostitutes here because he knew prostitution was a big business, mm -hmm. and he wasn't going to um, stop it from happening, but he wanted to control it. So he did give them a lot of rules. When the military came in, the military took over and they had got rid of all of Gabrielson's rules. They set up, they put out a set of rules of their own, which the women had to abide by. And one of them was that you could not bring a black prostitute into a home, into a, a, a bordello, unless there was already one there. If there was one there, you could bring in as many as you could. But if you wanted to bring one into an all white or, or if a black woman wanted to work in prostitution, she had to go across the New Luana River to Aala. And in Aala is where you find all of the different ethnicity, ethnicities, Native Hawaiians, Portuguese, Filipinos, Puerto Ricans, um, all the other ethnicities that tended to congregate in Aala because it was a slum area and it was very cheap right. to live. So you're saying essentially that the military was the one who segregated the women. Yes. Yes. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I would, I believe, and this is only a, a supposition. I don't like to use those is that, you know, if you were a black sailor and you wanted to have a black woman, you went to Allah and you didn't go to Chinatown. Unless there were the ones who were there, like you said, and maybe yeah. at that point, you know, people kind of had like these. And there's no way of knowing how many there were. There's so just no there were two entrances, right? There, there was the main entrance for the white soldiers and sailors, and then there was the back entrance for the non-whites, or what was the difference of the entrances and why? That comes from a single uh, oral history source. Uh, uh, Frank Spear, I believe is his name, was the provost marshal under martial law. And he spoke a lot about that, but I can't document it. And if I can't right. document it, I have a problem with using it. Okay, and and again, uh, there are limited sources of who produced what. We do have one photo that we got the rights to. I don't know if we want to share it now. It's just the spilling of soldiers and sailors in the streets. Is that Chinatown? Um, no, that's just a street scene, but it shows how crowded the streets were in World War II. You see a bunch of sailors and things like this, and 
And, you know, this is just the act kind of activity that was going on during World War II. Right. And so, you know, the whole thing is all of a sudden you have these, I don't know, what was the number of the amount of sailors and soldiers who came in at the beginning of the war? Well, at the beginning of the war, there were 345,000 people here. Okay. And uh, about 50,000 defense workers, okay. many of whom lived in Chinatown and lived in the area because they no longer wanted to live in the uh, barracks that were supplied by the military. Right. Um, but the largest percentage were sailors who came in, you know, after after Pearl Harbor. Right, Pearl right. So they were spilling was... in, and and families here were afraid that these young, um, horny soldiers basically were going to rape their wives, and so they that's why they regulated with this whole systemic kind of um, no. structured prostitution. No, no, that's not Is that not I the know. justification of no. why they legalized there... it in some sense. There are several reasons why. First of all, the military knew that it was a good idea to keep the sailors happy and the soldiers happy. Um, not that they were being happy before World War I because they were coming in anyway and the soldiers had been here since the turn of the 19th century, okay. but the turn of the 20th century. So <clears throat> that was, it was mainly because first of all, uh, houses and the prostitutes paid taxes. They were, they were they paid their federal taxes and paid something close to 15 million dollars into the federal system before the war was over and okay. when, the, when the brothels were shut down on september 22nd by governor stainback uh they all had to leave and they took a big source of income with them so there were a lot of businesses jewelers furriers and others who depended on their business quite a bit Okay, so back to the women and the business sense of these prostitutes, like going back to Jean O'Hara and all the other people who came out and made their, you know, fortunes. Um, they, would you say that they had agency, um, you know, because you have a lot of the other countries like Korea, we had the, or the comfort women, um, where they were victims of war, whereas can we relook at the prostitutes in Honolulu as being in a very different situation. I mean, there were some claims of being white slavery, but at the same time, these women had their 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 power, their mobility, and you know, essentially their own business they did. They, they did, at least two of them um, left here uh, with over $100,000 in their pockets. And one of them was a madam, actually two of them were madams, uh, and they took their money and they left. And as I said, there were a lot of them here that had been here since the late 20s. So there was not this cycling through of prostitutes that, you know, we're going to work here for six months and then leave. They went back and forth to San Francisco. If you look at the uh, manifests, you can yeah. see. And I've often wondered if they were going back to families or they were going back to tell their friends, hey, here, it's time to come. But to some degree, the Man Act which was a, the act that was passed against white slavery, was a federal act. So the city and county didn't bother themselves with that. It was a federal thing. And I found some evidence where uh, one of the madams with a couple of uh, pimps from San Francisco brought a woman over and they were caught and they were subsequently sent back to San Francisco to be tried uh, and be incarcerated, uh, but there weren't very many, there wasn't very much documentation out there about that. Because but your sense is that these women who did come over took advantage of the time and actually got away, most of them anyway, with what they were doing. I mean, there was a photo, again, it's mm -hmm. another quite famous photo of the Senator Hotel, of these women. Yeah. You want to talk and a little bit about that? all white. Yes. <laughs> You're right. But again, these are the things that are published. That doesn't mean that mm -hmm. the others did not exist. So mm -hmm. these women were the ones you're talking about who came over mostly from California, even if they were from some other Midwestern town, sure. but they came out through there mm -hmm. and made their fortune. Uh, but there was one lady you told us of me about before that didn't have such a happy ending. Do you want to talk about her? Oh, yes. Bernice Kimbrell. She's a very interesting woman. She was out here early. She started here in 1929 and she went through went by several names like many of them did. Uh, they would change their names frequently because they were, you know, they kept getting picked up, but only charged for vagrancy, like I said, which was usually a $50 fine 
and then they were just kicked up back out on the street. So there was no incentive really for them to stop what they were doing. But she worked, at one point she bought what was called the Plaza Hotel, which at one point was a very nice hotel. And it kind of fell into disrepair. So she bought it and she fixed it up in such a way that when it was raided in the late 30s, there was a long description about how lovely the place was with pink lights and a huge dining room table and a silver service and 24 rooms. And when they came in, they scared out a lot of um, high class males and army majors and officers who were there. They all jumped out windows and ran away. So she did very Mostly well. white patrons? Again, sorry to go back. Yes. Okay. Yes. All white patrons. Okay. Um, you didn't have, you did not have Asian or black officers then. The Navy didn't integrate until 1944. And the only blacks that were out here that before then were Seabees. And they were, they were located on Manana Peninsula, a long way away from Honolulu. But what about the local blokes, the, the, you know, non-white people here before the war you know where would they go and patron i mean i'm going off topic a little bit but like i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> i have no idea there like i said the records about ethnicity are scarce to none mm. um and the only time you ever see any kind of ethnicity is when there's an arrest of a pander or a pimp and those are all exclusively filipino and i don't well, know I think why that, that is, is. I don't know why that is. That's a whole we'll, other length. Okay. Of of <laughs> we'll wear off. We won't come back yes. around. We won't and we'll go back center around <laughs> these. So these these women who are predominantly white that we're talking about who came over during this time. Um, yeah, so they they took advantage of the time and and of course Bernice Kim did not have as fortunate. No, she did it. not have a happy ending. <laughs> um she was she finally uh picked up stakes. And about 1941 and took with her, according to a source, a woman named Jean Hobbs, who was a, 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 a newspaper reporter who lived here and wrote prolifically to her boyfriend and her mother about how she had invited her for lunch one day and, and uh, Bernice had shown up with a, a bag full of diamonds and a bunch of cash at, worth about $85,000. And she left, but and supposedly was retiring to go run a rabbit farm in California. But she came back at some point because um, she, in 1947, she was brutally murdered in Tin Pan Alley. She was stabbed seven times, uh, allegedly because she had uh, stolen money from a man who had paid for sex. Uh, she, he was later charged with murder and figured out was mentally oh, he ill. Was. Yes, uh, but when they did her estate, she had over eighty thousand dollars in her estate, including property, which includes the Plaza Hotel. So, so she was who there. that went to? She didn't have any kids. Who would who would that money go to? I haven't traced that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but but back to the women who did survive. Um, most of them went off and took their money and bought property, right? Some of them bought property in Hawaii. Some of them brought it back to, with them. And and oh, didn't, didn't one lady, was it who was it that opened up a rabbit farm or something? No, that was Bernice Kimbrell. She oh, swore that, that she was going to oh. go back and run one. And maybe she did. She but it's she came back. You know, yeah. I guess. She really was it greed that brought her back into it, you think? Well, or she told Jean Hobbs that she wanted to run the best little whorehouse west of Singapore. So she still had it in her mind that she was going to continue doing what she was doing. Um, but, you know, the, it, it just goes to show that the prostitutes here could stay here for quite a long time and make quite a bit of money. Many sure. of them own property in Kaimaki and Manoa, yeah. uh, other places like that, because they were allowed to own property. Right. She, Chief Gabrielson put out all of these rules that they couldn't own property or go to Waikiki or all of these other things. When the military came in, military swept that away and gave them their, put out all, their own set of rules, including they couldn't live in the houses. They had yeah. to leave by 6 p.m. and go live out on the economy. Right. So a lot of them bought property because they feared that if they rented, it might get around that their prostitutes yeah. and landlords would kick them out. And it did happen a few times. 
But that's what I'm saying. They're quite clever to think about these, you know, to get themselves a space, to take advantage, knowing that this was a temporary yeah. moment where you have that money, cash flow, you know. So what do you these think about women? These were smart women. Yes, right. So the going back to the agency of these women who knew what they were doing and, and mm -hmm. not to um, moralize it. You know, you always get that from people. But, you know, setting all that aside, all the criticisms aside from these um, virtuous, um, you know, families who feel like it's just the wrong thing to do. What do you have to say um, about women in general who who take advantage of situations and do things um to break barriers for themselves to think for themselves i mean how, how do you from well i mean when you look at prostitution for instance in the south at that time you can imagine that they were pretty poor i mean the people there in general were pretty poor it made sense to come somewhere particularly if you'd heard that hawaii was this place where you could make money regardless of how exotic it was something i really don't like much about that particular phrase um so it made sense to come now i'm sure a lot of them came made some money and left but like people like you know bernice kimbrell she was smart she didn't you know like i said they didn't jail these women when they caught them even right. when prostitution became illegal the fines usually went up yeah um, in maybe, fact, did, weren't they bold enough to protest something at one point? Weren't there like a, like a few? <laughs> yeah, that was Bernice Kimbrell and another woman who was also uh, quite a crusader, unlike Jean O'Hara, who would rather just write about the salacious things going on and, and write about her life. Uh, Peggy Miller, um, actually, Jean Kimbrell and Peggy Miller actually picketed the police station on Merchant and then marched around to the head of the chair of the um, the police commission because they were being by Gabrielson they were being yeah. forced to pay big money for well, houses in Iowa. Sorry, Wendy. Sorry, but you know you're bringing up a new character when we have like no more time left. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know we have What's to leave it at that. Um, what I'm glad and gracious um, and appreciative of is that you've kind of offered a glimpse of these different types of women who really had the guts, the bold, the the color of their personalities or whatever it was that brought them to Hawaii at the time and place. Um, thank you for kind of resituating history through your research and challenging what we think we know out there and people out there, please kind of just, you know, do diligence on what you read. And um, if you want to learn more information about the history of Honolulu prostitution, you have to dig deeper than what's just on the surface. And, it, and we're trying to do that here, but hopefully we'll do another conversation around this sometime in the near future. So when we- I would we, love to. Uh, I'd like to talk more about Jean and I'd also like great. to talk more about these women because they were something else. Really. Perfect. Thank you they so much for giving us the, 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 the nice little portrait of Gina O'Hara and Bernice Kimbrell. Thank you okay. for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.